Hi, my name is Benedict. Welcome to today's Mix Walkthrough. Our guest today is Terry, Terry Wilson of Terry Wilson Music. Uh, I encountered Terry, as is common enough, in a forum where he presented a track. Now, there are a lot of things that I actually liked about his track and still really like about his track. But the problem I had with the way that it was presented was that it felt far too loud overall. It felt like every instrument or every part was treated as kind of equal. And it, as a result, felt kind of like... And that there was this progression of parts and bits and pieces, but not necessarily a sense of, here's our story, here we're going. So I, I said, let me see if I can have a go with this. Let's start by giving you what I first heard. <laughs> As you notice straight away it's really hard that that uh, the synth sound we've got two sounds here there's a higher and a lower and the higher is a beautiful sound uh, I, I love that sound um, the lower it pushes hard it becomes ugly and the way it's mixed with the the, the, the lower sound becoming dominant over the higher sound is fashionable maybe but it we end up with a very now that could be a legitimate strategy it's one i used myself in a track and interestingly enough people didn't like it because it made them feel unhappy which is the whole idea a track about unhappiness should make people feel but it bothered me there was this whole section that's Again, very loud. It's like everything is really, really pushed forward. I know that's been the fashion in, in mixing for the last yeah. 10 or so years, but it's a fashion that is going away and it creates a problem. Because as I've said, you can't guide the listener through what you want them to pay attention to. <laughs> See, there you've got the really nice trumpet line with shades of jazziness. You've got various other synth sounds and, of course, your backing sounds as well, but they feel jumbled because everything is everything at the same time rather than sort of saying, here's our lead, here's our supporting parts. Everything is just like this all the time. And it goes around. That was the original version. And normally I don't show these versions because normally I get the person to send me across that as the MP3 for our AB. Now Terry did what a lot of people will do, is he sent me a different mix. And I notice here that appears to be mix 33. Now Terry, I'm not having a go at you personally in any of this. And I know you asked me, oh, don't pick on me, man. But my answer there, and, and I'm giving that answer here very openly, is that mixed walkthroughs are not about you, the person who posted me this track. They're about all of us. Yes, you can learn a lesson from this. And the lesson that I'm going to say is if this is your 33rd mix of this track and you're still struggling with it, something's wrong. If you went out with the same woman and you asked her 33 times to marry you and every time she basically said no or was evasive which is a no is that the woman who wants to marry you probably not it makes for a good rom-com but probably not is the answer because she's not as into you as you'd like her to be if your track is needing so many versions before you feel like you can get it right, then again, it may make for a really nice Hollywood movie, but chances are it means that you're missing the point of your track. And this is what I mean, the essence of what I mean with regards to story. There needs to be some avenue that your track is taking, and if you're not feeling that, if you're not clear in that, 
you don't know how to mix. You might know how to do a whole lot of tips and tricks inside mixing, but you don't know how to mix your track because you don't know what its path is. So my approach to mixing this was probably quite different from yours. Let's do an AB because I always do. So we'll start with what I got sent secondarily and there were some changes. Straight away this is not as aggressive as it was. It's, it's celebrating more of the beauty side of it, which is that lovely lead sound. And the lower sound is not threatening now, which is good. Now if we stop and think, well what's dominant in each half or in each version of this mix, in the original here, the bass and the drums seem dominant. And easier to say, oh but that's what they're supposed to be, it's EDM man, that's what it's all about. But basses and drums are a dime a dozen, absolutely a dime a dozen, therefore you're not unique. So perhaps look at, well, what is unique? My approach to this was probably completely upside down, as I started to say. So listen to what we got here. We've got some clear leads. I've chosen the leads as being in order the trumpet, and the voices, because they are the obvious things to be leads, because not only are they carrying kind of melodic elements, but they are traditional lead instruments. That doesn't mean I'm automatically going to choose them. If they weren't carrying melodic evocative elements, I would have buried them. You looked at other mix walkthroughs where I've taken things that in theory were supposed to be melodic and just completely de-emphasized them and even made them, treated them as unmelodic. But you've got to pick something. And I've picked those because they're the obvious ones. They're the, where they're the ones that really have something evocative to say. Now, at the same time, you'll notice that drums and bass are still very much there, but it doesn't feel like they're in the front of the mix. They're playing their role as supporting the trumpets and the vocals. ourselves along a little bit. Notice a lot of the elements are similar, but I've brought up the sense of the pads a little bit more because they they are musical and it's a beautiful sound. There was a clever trick. Actually, I'll go into it that a little bit later. We'll just play it here. Now what Terry did was he made the mix narrow. He's got a very wide mix, which I've copied here, whether for right or for wrong, I've copied. And at that point, he narrows the mix down because this is the sort of... And then it springs back out again. I've, I thought that was an interesting idea. I, so I kept it, but I finessed it. But rather than one dimension, which you probably really struggle to hear in terms of the stereo, I've said, let's go two dimensions. So as well. So we actually are narrowing the whole mix down. We'll talk about that later. Pianos come in. It's nice. They support the melody. They, they, we finally get to where we're wanting to go. But you hear that the mix is, is fuller, it's brighter, it's spacier. Whether you like that or not, 
I'm never here saying that my mix is better than the other guy's mix. Well, to some extent I am, but what I'm saying is about is that I'm looking for the lead or the story. When we look into a mix, we should never, and I see so much of this, we, sh we should never be saying, oh, well, I'll listen to you know, this slice here. Sorry. And that sounds good, therefore it's a good mix. I see so many people who are looking and going, well, that little slice there, that sounds good, therefore it's a good mix. No, this is completely the arse about wrong end of town to be in. With a mix, you need to sell your whole song, your whole movement, your whole section. Because, again, mixes that sound good in slices are a dime a dozen. Just about everything on the radio, that sounds good in any, sl any given slice. So why would you choose to buy one song over another? You wouldn't. That's part of what's led to this whole Spotify put on a playlist and just get non-stop slices of perfect mixes. Okay, great. If that amuses you, you've got to have that right. But if you're a musician who's trying to make a mark in your world, you don't want that. You don't want people to listen to a slice of your mix and go, oh yeah, blammin', now give me another slice of some other random shit that's blammin'. Hasn't profited you any at all, because they don't remember you. You're just another generic slice of blamminess. Won't get you there. What you need to do is stand out. When the Beatles appeared, they stood out. They all had the same awful haircut. I wanna hold your hand. There were a lot of things they did that stood out. Not the beginning. They were a pretty ordinary band to start to start with. They weren't a bad band, but they were a pretty ordinary band to start with. Listen to the early stuff. Not that special. But they worked out how to be special. They worked out how to stand out as the Beatles. Just as the Rolling Stones worked out how to stand out as the Rolling Stones. You're a fan of the Beatles or you're a fan of the Stones. And I know that's a little childish, but they set themselves on two different paths. The Who set themselves initially a little bit in the middle and then they went woof right out there and ultimately became a sort of prog punk band. They, they laid a lot of the groundwork for punk. That story. So don't think in terms of little slices of your mix, every instrument is perfect and blam. Look for how do I make this whole piece so evocative that people want to take that ride again, that they want to say, wow, that, that, that track's really good. I'm going to go and buy that Duran Duran record. I'm going to buy that Terry Wilson track because it's emotionally big in me. All right, let's get to playing through the final mix.
here we go my mix of sparkable i like it i like my mix but i like the music uh, it's um it's a little bit of a slice of time it's not a a, a traditional verse chorus verse chorus um final countdown or rock the casbah or something like that but it has a really nice feel to it it is interesting in the sense that you've got this part here which isn't very related to these parts musically it probably is but sonically they're different but nonetheless it ends up making a very nice little piece let's have a look at how i got there so start with let's kill all these things what came through in many ways it was a lot tidier than most of what i get and kudos great that's that's nice the fact that you've put your sections it's kind of neither here nor there for me in many ways i don't work this way but you know what it is kind of nice and tidy it means that i don't immediately get things asked about uh, so it's not a bad thing to use i'm not into blocks in reason I'm not, I've never, never really been into loops. Um, one of my earlier sequences, it worked that way. You created patterns and chained them together. But I was happy to be out of that. That's, that's sort of a personal thing. But there's a great feature of blocks, which probably wasn't really intended, but does work this way in that when you use them, when you have a block and put it in, it puts color across the screen. I'm all about being tidy and organized because if you are untidy and not organized it saps your ability to see and know what is there which there is going to be some criticism of in this case not again to have a go at anyone in particular but to try to, to teach to sort of say look if you allow that to happen you actually create a lot of clutter and that clutter is there taking up your mind space when that space could be going to something else, like processing power. You know, if you, uh, if you installed 58 bits of malware on your computer and tried to run Reason, and all those bits of malware are sack su sucking cycles, but not for any purpose, would that be a wise strategy? You'd probably go, no, let's delete those things so that I've got and so same with if we've got garbage sitting in our project we're still having to process it which means that our poor little noggin gets tired processing the garbage and therefore has less energy to go and find something new i noticed that that's a little unusual we'll go over that later that's that uh, change in the break we'll go over how that was handled and show a more elegant way of uh, of handling that there was some MIDI left in here from when uh, certain things got rendered off because I didn't have Hive and blah, 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 Expanse. Although that, this sand here, that, that lead sand from the beginning is almost enough to make you want to have Hive. Um, and the Expanse sand is pretty darn cool too. Um, I assessed whether I was going to want to replace those sands. No bloody fear with that one. So I then tied it up and got rid of them. If I need them back, they're in the original file that I got sent. I'm not going to need them back. I made an executive decision. Kill. Gone. So I now work with what I've got rather than having to second guess through a lot of garbage. On the negative side, there were quite a lot of things in the rack, which you can't see now, but there were quite a lot of things in the rack which were empty mix channels. Don't ever leave empty mix channels in your rack. Get them gone. As soon as this thing does not serve a purpose, get rid of it. Yes, it meant that I could see things that had been tried, but they were things that had been dismissed. If you're not using the snare in your drum kit anymore, no real need to go and unload the samples or whatever unless you're struggling. But there is no cause to have wiring going to a process that's chewing cycles, not only in your CPU, but in your noggin. If it's no longer used, make the decision that it's gone. As long as you're thinking, oh, but, but, but I might want it back. 
you're not letting go, you're not letting yourself move forward. It's really important, like it's really important to divorce your first wife before you marry your second, third and fifth. It's that way legally because it gets awfully complex, makes a mess. So clean the mess by getting rid of everything that is not in use. If we had played with a snare and then decided, no, I, I don't want that snare, commit, gone, no snare. If somewhere down the track you go, you know what, a snare really would be a great idea. Chances are that the snare that you heard in your head as you thought this is going to be a good idea is not the snare you had. The snare you had may be a lindrum snare and it wasn't fitting. But somewhere down the track you might go, you know what, I can hear a snare in here, and what you're hearing is not going to be that Lindrum snare, or any variant thereof as a result of 58 layers of processing that have failed before. What you could be hearing is a 606 snare, or a 505 snare. You get my point? By letting go of it, you can start to hear something new come in. And at that point, you either instance a new device, or you'd go, okay, Snare drum, get rid of that, load the right sounds for what you need. Because you know what you need at that point. By hanging on to something you're not going to use, you're not leaving yourself free to find some, what you are going to use. Plus, of course, when it comes to someone like me, and it's like eight channels that don't actually do anything. They look like they do something. They can be all wired up to things, but they don't actually do anything. Not, 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 not the best way to set yourself up. But think more about yourself. Be clear, be decisive. And that forms part of your story, even if you can't see it at the time. What else did we have? Uh, organized stuff. He'd largely put things in color order. I moved things around so they, they kind of made sense, partially in terms of when they came in and also how they worked. Up in the, um, in the rack, got masters over on one side. Actually, we'll kill our masters for the moment because none of this is about mastering kill that kill that actually we might not kill that oh no we will kill that we will kill that and kill that because we need we're now looking at the mix not at the master because they're two separate things we might look at the master at the end but we're going to look at the mix and the way the mix sounds and the way the master sounds are not exactly the same this mix is where we're making our decisions. So as you see, I've killed everything in here. We might just shrink them all up too so we know that they're not doing anything. Those two would not normally be here. I might do them a little differently, but I wanted to show a, a way of doing this which was more elegant than what had been done before. Because elegance is really important, really, really important. And you might think no one cares because they don't hear it. But you know what they do? They hear the results. And if your wiring is inelegant, your mix will sound inelegant or feel inelegant. And if you doubt that, well, your business. In terms of what we had, I put the drums in. Now, because a lot of things are wired to a lot of other things, I had to turn off the auto group devices and tracks. Not a crisis, just be aware sometimes you've got to do that if you've cross wired from one device to another. It took a while, but I worked out that that was actually the core of the drum section, so it went number one. The cymbal only hits a couple of times, but it was related clearly, so I put them there. That's the core of, I could make the mix work with just those. Then we've got the kit, which in reality is only a kick and a tambourine. But they serve a purpose and, and well, so they stay. And we'll get on to the rest of that later. So drums and bass, I always put in my first rack. How you arrange is your business, but be arranged. I then put musical instruments in, kind of in the order in which they appear and some to some extent in their importance. Even though the piano is more important, it appears later. So I've let it stay down there. And on the end, I've separated out the vocals. While the trumpet is a sample, and all the samples have been put together, that's kind of thinking the wrong way. 
The trumpet is an instrument. It plays the role of an instrument, as these first three vocals do as well. They play the role of instruments. So I've put them kind of together. I could equally have put the vocals into the instrument section, but I have a habit of putting my vocals on the end. And then we've got sound effects. Commonly I put sound effects into another rack, but there was a bit of a blurring there between the vocals and the sound effects, so didn't feel the need to create a separate rack in this instance. Mixer. We got quite a lot of stuff, but not as much as we did have. When I opened this, there was a lot of extra mixer channels on the front end over here. Eight of them. They were sends. Sorry, but this is not the way to do sends. There is nothing wrong with bringing sends back in on a track. Nothing at all. So it's not that. But with a send, and I've seen this a couple of times, you send out part of your signal, so you're breaking it off, somewhat like a parallel. You're breaking that off, sending it to that effect, and then bringing the results of that effect back in to mix the two together. So if, if we have an insert and we put in a delay line, we're going to do a mix let's say 50-50. Bang, 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 bang. With a send, we've got our channel with our bang, and that's all that appears in our channel. We send that a copy of that bang off to our send, which is a delay line. That must be at 100% wet. Otherwise, what we bring back in is bang, 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 bang. We're paralleling. Now, if that's a deliberate decision, okay, but there's more elegant ways of doing that. Especially seeing you can have effectively an infinite number of delays in here, one per track, one per instrument, 78 per instrument. There are more elegant ways of doing this. So... A lot of what was there was redundant because it wasn't being used. Yeah, I know templates can seem like a cool idea. You start your session and you've got everything laid out, but it also becomes a trap because you go, oh, but, 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 but this is what I do. I have very, very, very little templated when I open up. I don't open up and have a piano sound because I'm always going to want a piano sound because that means I'm always gonna open up and start writing piano lines. I'm not gonna be writing violin lines because I've got a piano. It's gonna make me write piano lines, even if I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be a violin line. It's not to say that you cannot or should not write your violin lines on a piano, but when you're working in synth heavy music, get the sound, or at least a reasonable approximation of it because it's gonna influence the way you compose that section so it wasn't the most elegant way of doing it if you're using it if you want a mix probably do it in an insert put in your delay find the right balance of the initial bangs and the repeated bangs if you're after a send send that out and then fly it back in now you can choose to fly it back in on the back of the rack back of rack over here so you can send off to let's just pick the echo here actually no with the reverb so you can send to the reverb reverb does its reverby stuff and send back to your return dead simple don't need to get complex if I needed to do some further processing on my reverb, I would create myself a new effect. Um, why not a ring modulation? Because there's just nothing quite like ring modulating your reverb. I will take my return. So I have now chained what's happening with my reverb into a ring modulator. 
and that's just going back. I don't need to get complex with combinators or tracks or anything like that. That's just doing exactly what I wanted it to do. Obviously, I don't really want to remodulate my reverb because that's just going to well, be all kinds of ghastly. But that's an elegant way of solving that problem. If you want to come back on a channel, and there are times when you do want to do that, which I did want to do in this situation because the opportunity had been missed, then you create your send. Number five, see five doesn't come back. Created it, then create a mix channel. Wire this into your mix channel. I guess it's up to you on your SSL board whether you have your buses on this side or this side, but seeing in the Western world, us whiteys, we tend to read across the page from right to left. To me, it makes sense that I'm going to have my buses on my left. Up to you, but be consistent. You were consistent, so that was good. Now, when I come back into my mix channel over here, that's this echo, which is a send. I can now use the sends on it. That's the one reason why you really want to bring this in. Not to do further processing. That's messy. It's really inelegant. You can do it, but it's probably inelegant. It's harder to see. It's, it's harder to process. But I've brought this echo back in and then given it reverb. Otherwise, you've got your first sound with the reverb and then the repeats don't have the reverb. You might have a reason to want to do it that way, but it can make those echoes stick out like a sore thumb. So please, always think, how can I do this the most elegantly? Because there were quite a lot of instances in here of things that were wired to things and combinators that, that really didn't serve a purpose. Not only were they wasting CPU and GPU cycles, but they were creating clutter, which stops the mind from clearly seeing what the music is. Now, let's get into the music. Long blair, but it's important stuff, super important stuff. My first question had to be, sorry, this is always a pain in the ass for me. Where is the music in this? Where is the story in this? Where is the narrative? Where is the emotive thing that makes me go on a journey? To me, that was pretty obviously in this. There's a call and response there. So the trumpet lines they are clearly my leads in this situation. So let's go find said to rumpet. Trumpet. It's I don't know where it's coming from. It's kind of a sample, it's audio, but it's got here. So what did we do to our trumpet? We'll turn that off so that we can listen to a section. I'm going to need to get this mixer up too. It's, it's a big pain in the ass for me working on one screen and I always struggle with it. You think I'd get more used to it, but I don't. It's a pain. So our trumpet is got echo and the delay on it. So we get rid of those. This is a bit of a mash. If we zoom in on this, it's an audio recording. How it's come by, I don't know. Don't entirely care. It's also not entirely in time. A lot of elements in this aren't actually in time. It'd be easy to say, oh no, shocking, I've got to move them all to time. I did not, and I'm glad that they were not done this way. On their own, you might be like, but once you put together into the, once you get the collage completed, that out of timeness creates some of the movement in it. So we've got our trumpet line. Created in part with chops in the middle. 
Fair enough. That's the instrument. I'm not going to fight it. I probably wouldn't have done it, but I'm not going to fight it because it's working. It sounds nice. But because there are chops in the middle, we have to decide how we're going to handle those. We can make them a feature or we can smooth them over. I'm going with the smooth over in this instance because this is the lyrical line. Making a vocal out of chopped bits and pieces of somebody else's speech, it's hard to make that flow. What if you just did it in the forum with um, uh, bits and pieces of Donald Trump? Kudos for getting it and making it work. So, trumpet. What did we do? The first thing that I actually did with this trumpet was to work out these echoes and reverb before anything else she will turn all this off let's just zoom back out on this a bit Oh, there are sections that are turned off. Again, I would say get rid of them. We don't want turned off sections because if they're not being used, get rid of them. Don't commit to which path you're going. I didn't turn them on to see. So that's what we've that's what we've got as our line. The reverb is really important in this because the reverb, the echo, the sense of space around this trumpet is an important part of the sound of this trumpet. So it's the first thing I dug into. Straight away I thought, I'm actually going to go with a convolution on this. Normally I avoid convolution somewhat like the plague. I see them as being the audio equivalent of those kind of Instagram things where you stick bunny ears on yourself. They sound great in the right situation, but fail everywhere else. Uh, they're not as adaptable as algorithmic. However, this is a, a pastiche, there's something cartoony in this whole thing. Not in a negative sense, it's, it's a stylized thing. And the, the, the IR thing is very stylizing. So I found a style that worked nicely and used that. Straight away, that starts to smooth over some of those choppy edits. It almost makes it sound like it's being played that way. Great, we're now transforming this into a real instrument. It's a real little boy. We've got the delay. Now remember, that's going as a send. It's coming back in a mixed channel so that we can put some reverb on. If we don't put the reverb on, sounds okay there, but then we end up with a mismatch once we've got our reverb here. Here how the echoes don't carry all the impact of the initial. And they would. We want this to feel organic, for feel real. So those echoes are very echoey, like very echoey indeed, because there's a lot of reverb on them. They will still sit in the mix really, really nicely, but they're not going to stand out as obvious repetitions of the thing. They give us that really nice, huge jazz 3 a.m. in the alley kind of a sound. Number one was get that right. The other part of it was our EQ. I wanted to pull up what was important. Now we've got low and high pass filters. Fair enough. Whilst it's soloed, it's good to have all this 
guff down here. That's why it's recorded that way. But because we've got a lot of bassy stuff going on, we want to clarify that bass, in which case let's get rid of what's going on down there. It's not serving a purpose in the mix. Up here, he'd actually rolled off quite aggressively. I understand that there's a tendency to be sort of afraid of or negative about the brighter sides of sounds. It's like, oh, we want them all to sound big and by rolling off the brightness they seem less big yeah but they also don't make their way through the mix which forces you to do a lot of other stuff to them the best way to get something to come through the mix is for it to have stuff happening up here but this sand doesn't want to be brittle you were trying to avoid brittle fair enough it needs body it needs to feel warm so i found that here Overdo it. Fine, where does it seem the warmest? Now this is great because the 1K area is a cutting frequency. And you might think, oh, well, what I would do would be, that's a bad frequency, so let's make it go away. Let's do this. Now it sounds warm. I can just turn that fucker up and it'll be great. You're doing more work to achieve a worse result. Therefore, find the point where it really cuts, but cuts with the character you want, which is to bring some cut, clarity, and warmth. And being a trumpet, it's got plenty in that region. So, one move rather than two or three moves. Very efficient, nice sound, done. The next bit were our vocal bits. Our vocal bits are, well, they're a collage, very much a collage. Let's go back here. I don't know where they're sourced again. They may well have come from several different places. But together with the horn, they work. So together, they create a narrative. That is the center of our story. It's a call and response, a conversation happening between either several things, like several people, one of whom's a trumpet and then these three other voices, or a person and a voice. You can decide, but that's it. Once we've got this working, so I went through those sounds. We'll unsolo the others. The hmm sound. This one's the least vocal of the lot. Nothing happened to that. Nothing was done to that in here. You see, no, no work was done there. It was just in the EQ. A lot happening down there. We don't want that. Get that gone. Not really a lot happening up here either. And we don't ever want it to fight with the trumpet. If this was a singer singing a lead vocal, I would not do that. I'd be looking to have that as clear and as bright and as sparkly as possible so that that lead vocal would cut through. But here it's a supporting part, an important supporting part, but a supporting part nonetheless. So. That, now there's a certain sound in here which I did not like. In however the sound's being created, there's some kind of phaser. Love phasers. Because this was a vocal part, I wasn't sure I really liked that. I couldn't get rid of it, 
And even if I had gone and turned that effect off, if I'd had the ability to do it, it may not have been the right thing to do. I just didn't want this to sound overly phasey because it's a vocal in this instance. So just found it, got rid of some of that. It helps the ear to focus on the body part of it. That's what I wanted. I want the synth of warmth out of it. Not the slightly unsettling eh on the high end of it, but the ooh, the warmth in it. So by de-emphasizing some of that, this becomes stronger. Rather than boosting in this case, because it was still going to leave all this stuff, use the rules of masking just to reduce this a bit, and this becomes more dominant. That's that fella done. This one. Now this one, if I recall correctly, this one originally had a glitch effect on it. There seemed to be some sense of confusion as to why I would not own glitch, but my response was that my aim in life is to make things beautiful, not to chop them up. Press the right button. And that is beautiful. If it's beautiful, I don't want to chop it up. Your decision. So remember, I, I like Cannibal Corpse. I love Iron Maiden. Not things that most people would, outside of the thing, say were beautiful. They're beautiful in their right. This is beautiful in itself. I want to expose that beauty and, and enhance it. Oh, we should be looking at the effects here. To just remind myself to do that. So... The glitch didn't come across, not unhappy about that at all. Again, it's really just EQing here. Actually, I will turn off our effects. I think I've invertedly turned something else off. Not having the best morning today, a little all over the place. So we've chopped off. Not too much there, but it's it's just not serving a purpose. So we'll get rid of it. Because again, we've got a lot of bass-heavy stuff to deal with later. We don't want it down there. I've really focused on bringing out the clarity in her voice. Because this is a line that really wants to appeal to us. It wants to make us reach out to who is this person. So where this one here, I chased warmth and de-emphasized the, the harder parts of it. With this one, I've actually de-emphasized the warmth of her and gone for this, oh, the, the beauty, the real beauty is up in there. So the two balance each other out as well. So that's really what was done there. And the ooze. This one was a little bit more aggressive in what was done to it. Because uh, we've got... I'm going to say she was probably too close to the mic. <laughs> uh, so a lot chopped off the bottom there. Uh, it was just too intimate. I know that that's a fashion in modern recording to be all like with the microphone, but it, it's not beautiful. Um, so... Uh, it's right that that be rolled off and generally gotten rid of so as a result uh, of masking or unmasking because these are masking the beauty which is in the air that makes her sound delicate uh, makes us want to take care of her so that's why that again just a slight roll off here because by being so close to the mic you overemphasize that and it's it, it goes from being air to just being kind of up your nose 
works are de-emphasized because again it's it's a supporting part but together they create this result so if we put that back together all our vocal parts let's play them from here i've bust them no particular processing oh except on this one the r yes there was i that was the one i really that was the phasey I really attacked that very aggressively, including with, um, uh, where is, yeah, uh, now where is it, this is not, things aren't always following what I want them to follow at the moment, that's something I noticed in this project, see, so in, If we turn that off, there's a, uh, oh hang on, I didn't turn it off. Brain. Hear that real harshness that's there? It's just not nice. Uh, so having this in, I knew there was one I had to do that too, yeah. It was really harsh. It's like, ugh. Uh, so I was aggressive on that by being this aggressive, including using uh, dynamic EQ. We could have used the static EQ. But it actually still draws attention to that that I don't like. Interestingly, when you introduce a dynamic EQ, you can have either more or less compression of, or change of, of the um, a cut and boost. But because it's moving, somehow you don't notice as much. So when you're having to work hard and it's still not giving you the result you want, but this is the job you have to do, then definitely look at a dynamic EQ because it allows you to either have less EQ and achieve a better result, or a lot more EQ and achieve a better result. Because it's moving, the thing that's bothering you is probably something that's static, and it allows you to create movement where something was rigid and static. So that was something that was done. Our vocals all come to a bus. Now with the bus they are just summed. One screen, how do people live with their one screen? Looks like a lot of compression but there's very very little. See the, the, the gauge is set to set to very sensitive. And this is across all of our little vocal parts and it just helps put them together even though they never really work together it helps say this unifies them it's not a glue because we're not gluing them together at any point but we're giving them a sense of of sameness and control my first thought was actually to use my regular go-to for this sort of thing which was salix leveler but in this case a compressor worked nicer and Katelnikov is actually quite a transparent compressor. I think it's nicer than the M-Class one. The M-Class gets its job done, but it somehow gets it done in a way that doesn't feel that great. Nothing against it. I've used it a lot. I've learned a lot with it. I've learned how to duplicate things from other compressors, but there are better solutions. And seeing the, the basic version of this has no cost. It's one that I have not used as much as I could have recently, but I've put back in the lineup because I think it does its job elegantly and the ability to balance peak and RMS compression is, is really nice. It's a, it's a nice device. You won't get that heavy pumping, look, Ma, I'm compressing stuff out of it, but it's not meant to be. It's, it's meant to be subtle. I've looked at it as the the SSL glue compressor don't love it for that but for things like this where you want a compressor to be well behaved without drawing attention to itself beaut job that's our things together rather than sending out two buses separately I've used our shared 
echoes. So we've reduced the number of things that are being sent to one reverb that goes across almost everything and that echo. Because if we have an echo on only one thing, it can make it stand out far too much. So we've got a couple of shared things here and that echo is shared back into the mix because it's sent to the reverb. It's our vocal, so we've got our vocal and horn mix. Now, it's, I know it's very bits and pieces on its own, but it was important to me to get that feeling beautiful and cohesive and that it leapt out and wanted to draw the listener in before I moved on. The next thing that I went to, obviously, was these pianos. Let's just... get rid of that. The next thing were pianos because they carry a lot of melody at this point. It takes a while to get them in the mix but once they're there they uh, they carry a lot of power for us. They really pull all this melody together. Now the piano has been delivered in two halves. There's a just the chords part which is this On its own, I did nothing but low pass. If it was a solo piano, I wouldn't low pass it, but because we've got bass, again, just get rid of it. So this is actually a full piano line. We've got two hands here, but there's another thing that we hear when we're listening to our piano. And let me just move it over there for the moment. And that's this fellow. Our third hand. And that's actually really important because that ties everything together. So collectively, what we end up with is this. Now you don't necessarily hear that as being two separate piano lines, it just joins together. And that's nice. But nonetheless, the high part, the solo, is, is pretty darned important. And it's easy to get lost in that mix, but it needs to stand out because this is what keeps our interest. So where the chords, nothing's really been done with them, this part we've really focused on bringing out the um, the clarity of it. Oh, and both of them were named again. I know this is going back, but both of these were named Atlantic Records. Don't name things based on the patch name. Not if you've got two of them, because now I've got two tracks called Atlantic Records. What's that got to do with anything? Yes, it's the patch, and that's what it came in with, but far better to call it chords and high part, because nobody gives a flying banana peel that it's the Atlantic Records preset. Maybe someone in a forum will ask you, what preset was that man? But you know what? It's not going to match what they are hearing, not by the time I'm done with it, and that was deliberate. Because, let's face it, while Radical Piano is actually really a nice device, especially for the price now it's included, it's a rompler, and it sounds like a rompler. If you want the rompler sound great, go with the preset. Let it live exactly as it is. I did not want it to sound like a rompler because I wanted this track to sound unique. So it's a case of going in there and giving that some, uh, some uniqueness and some processing. So if we pick On its own, sounds great, but a piano always sounds great on its own. Obviously, we don't want any of the, the lows. 
Yes, it pulls some body out, but you know where the body's coming from? Those cords. This just wants cut. So again, I've pulled some more of the body out, really giving it cut, but that can make it a little brittle. So pulled off some of this. Now, a lot more of this was pulled off before, but I've wanted to balance the two parts together. The other issue then was that they both came in centered. So you know how piano recordings tend to have stereo and they tend to be bass down on the left and treble up on the right? It made it hard to separate those parts out. They didn't sound so good. So I narrowed them up, moved my chords to the left, because generally things that are established are on this side. Things that are coming are on this right, this side, over on the right. So we've separated those out. Not so much that we hard pan them, like Tipton and Downing. I hear far too much hard panning of things, and it sounds they go straight past your head. Your brain doesn't want to listen to them. It's weird. So they're still together, but they're separated out to help the lines behave. The solo piano bit's a little bit louder, but again, it sounds like they're together. What did I do to them? Because I did do stuff to them. On their own, nothing. But where I put the piano together, I've processed them. windows aren't automatically following. I noticed that in this project, I don't know why. Nothing done to the piano as such, but I've brought this EQ in. This is a nice EQ. For a, for a freebie, there's a paid version which I haven't investigated, but the freebie is really a nice sounding EQ. A little bit of, a little bit of saturation, a little bit of colour in it, does a really nice job. What I'm looking to do is give the piano as a whole, I'm bringing it back into being a whole. I split it in half and bring it back together. Boost those lows a little. I know I got rid of a lot of them, but boost them a little bit. We're now looking to say, let's pull you together. Sounds a little flat there. Give it a bit of a boost, somewhere where it's gonna cut, because it's important that this piano cuts through and then plenty on the high end to give it that brightness. Sounds very rompler, doesn't it? Because everything's flat and even and perfect and close mic'd and there's no character in this. I did actually go through putting a scream on this and I tried really hard to get the scream to give me the sound that I wanted uh, but in the end it overdid everything. I then tried parallel mixing them but scream messes with your phase and so it just it, it was causing more problems than good so I said okay let's simplify which was this. Notice how subtle that is, but it's just that sense of a little bit of presence in the lows. Brightness in the highs. Because whatever's got brightness in the highs will pull through. And that mids. Because I want it to sound like a piano with character. A piano in a jazz group has character. You do hear more modern jazz recordings where the piano is like a rompler, even though it's a Beckstein and it's been perfectly recorded and it sounds like a bloody rompler. There's no joy in that. This has a sense of groove and feel to it, so the piano has to have feel. Um, I went through the various modes. I liked the way the Soviet style of EQ curves and what have you match this, it gave it more of a, a character. Yes, you might say, oh, but it's less perfect, it's less good. That's the whole idea. This is like some upright piano in a corner somewhere. We want people to feel that. It's subtle, 
but they will feel that there. So that's got a lot of our piece actually working now. So if we go through, we've got, actually let's do what I normally do. I didn't do this at the beginning, I should have. My apologies. We've got all these bits working. We'll mute these guys because they are not in my process yet. So this is how I'm building up how my mix goes. And you might go for what's essentially an EDM mix. This is our Sabat. Yes, deliberately. So that we do not fall for the problem that, that occurs in most EDM mixes of filling it with drums, overfilling it with bass, and then going, yeah, now we're screwed which forces you to force everything through, which, well, gives you very forced feelings to your mixes. So this is my mix so far. If that were my whole mix, and it kind of could be, because it sounds nice, I would have a warmer piano, but, but I know I've got all this extra bassy stuff to come in, so I don't want that to compete. But if you're thinking, gee, the piano sounds thin, yes it does, because it's got to play a role later. But for now, we've got all these parts working together really nicely. What's essentially a collage, all works together, it's become this cohesive unit. And that's what I want to hear all the time. Could I release this mix now? Yes, I could. Like I said, I'd change the piano part, but I could release that now because it's it's got its narrative, it's all there. Everything else is now going to be cheese. And good cheese, I love cheese. I never use the word cheesy to say that something's bad. That's, that's a stupid thing to say. Everything is gravy, it's gonna be cheese. I love cheese. So then, in case of looking at, well, what bits come next? What happens next in this? I decided, okay, I'm gonna go with the melodic parts and I'm gonna start from the beginning of the track. So the obvious one was this guy here. So let's unmute him. Whack him in solo. This came to me as a way of file. I did nothing to in the inserts to this, just a little bit in the EQ. an almost Garen Newman-y sort of sound, the kind of thing that you know, got me into synthesis in the first place. This is a this is a lovely line. I, I'd, I'd be delighted to have written this line, especially with this sound. Because we're going to have to compete with a bassier sound at the same time, pull just a little bit of that out, giving a little bit of a boost here. We're just looking for that fizzy sort of feel to come through. Actually, again, that's not the right sound. This is annoying me. It's not following properly. Okay, so just, again, just boosted here. It was the other sound that, that I had to cut in some of the low mids. As most of what the sound does, it appears a little bit here, but it's a beautiful, beautiful sound. In terms of what I did to it for res reverb, I sent it to the shared reverb and its delay, but I pulled those levels right back. Because when it goes in at full level, because this has been sent to me with a lot of reverb on it, it's a little bit of a no-no. When something's gonna be mixed, don't send a pile of reverb. Um, but nonetheless, the reverb wasn't fighting with what I was doing, but where I tried to put on a normal amount of this mix's reverb, it just went Pff. Um but we've got there, so no problems. So that sound was then added in. This is the next one along, the adrift sound. Not 
nice sound. That EQ. It's a pretty spiky sound. It's meant to be spiky. But we've just got to have it in a way that doesn't fight with our other sand. So just that, that little bit there, remember as I said, I know it's got to deal with, uh, with a fairly midi bass, um, or mid full bass, I guess maybe, because it's all midi. That's done on, on that. That's really all I needed to do on those. Again, it just needed to have its um, its shared reverb. It didn't want that as much in the way of delay on this because the delay was already baked in. It's okay; it's worked out. Not not a real not a real drama there. You've got to be a bit careful sending things with a lot of delay on them because they can they can snooker your mix engineer but it's worked out okay so not not a problem if this were more of a, a a rock mix or something like that i might have had to send it back be like get turn the delays off your guitar don't send it to me that way but synthesizers we can be a little bit more flexible but still be very very cautious the delays and reverbs that are inbuilt in the preset can often cause you real mix problems later you're better off back turning them off or backing them off so that you can go with your mix space and that way they will feel like they they gel together so much easier less processing too next sound along so we get to this the synth swell same thing in terms of just a little bit of the same kind of eq nice sound really nice sound don't know that I know where this came from, so I don't think I can synth spot it for you. It's warm, and that's really nice, but because we've got other things going on in the mix, its role is just to rise up in amongst a busier mix, and where it's thick here, it can just create a little bit of mud, which causes us some problems, and because it's muddy, we then we feel like we're not hearing the, the, the real reason we want it which is this and we start turning it up and <laughs> we start messing with everything else better to just say okay let's back that off a little bit and that way we're going to get what we need from it without feeling like we've got a thin sound I mean on its own it's still a lovely sound but don't get so attached to a sound or oh, but it has to feel that way no no it's got to do its job in the mix then we've got this funny little fella that just comes in sometimes. The synced... Oh, hang on, no, no, plucky bands. Not a good day for Benedict. Uh, oh, hang on, they're backwards. I struggled with that all the way through this, that there was a lot of... A um, lot of stuff in here that uh, just made it confusing. Give me a sec. don't want those muted why are they muted so the swell we've done the lucky bands that's what I want this is a this is a fun sound now if I recall correctly this had a pretty aggressive EQ on it and I undid that uh, I know there was something that I, that I undid a fairly aggressive EQ on. I've given this quite a lot of space. It's come dry. That's good. That's how a synth sound should come. It's like, not very nice on its own, but a mix is made of lots of things that aren't very nice on their own. I've given it that, that echo. Which, for some reason... Oh, because of course the solo. <laughs> That's why I had to do it that way. And the uh, and the reverb. That's, this is a frustration I have with Reason with regards to its um, soloing. On a real SSL, 
Not that I've ever had the chance to use one, but on a real SSL there's a solo in place option, and I've noticed it in some other doors. So in a situation like this where it knows that it's tied, it will actually put the other thing into solo as well. Reason does that nicely with groups. So where I've grouped stuff into a bus, when I press solo on something in the bus, then it, it puts the, the, the bus into a solo as well. But this is a, a frustration. So where you fly things back in, you end up with like, why is that not working? It's because I need to put it in solo as well. Now this starts to play along with the piano parts. Mixing these kinds of sounds is, is interesting because they very easily fall below the mix, they fall out of the mix, and you push them a little too hard, they, they overdo the mix, which is why I've given it a boost sort of more here than up here. It's easy to say, oh, but this is a bright sound, so we want it to do this. But if it's our lead instrument, yeah, all for it, all for it. Very nice and new agey. But in this situation, it's not. It's just a supporting instrument which adds a little bit of character and movement, in which case it's far better to pick a warmer part of its sound, which is in its fundamental. But the rest will still cut through, but subtly, without doing that, as I say, super bright, new agey sound. Uh, and then, yeah, now we get to the synced phase apart. This was a real synth. Ooh, an antidote. Not my favourite synth. Don't know why other people love this thing. I, I struggle to create a good relationship with it. Now it's quite a cool sound but it doesn't do everything we wanted to do in this situation and I had to come back and fix it this morning as well. So our sand, on its own you go, oh cool sand, lots, lots of range, lots happening, take it out of solo, it kind of just does too much, yeah this one I think had a lot of heavy EQ on it, backed it off but there is the squeaky up top which isn't flattering. There's a lot of lower down stuff which serves no purpose. But it was easier to say we want to push it through the mix here. They're the obvious cut frequencies. But again, it was nicer to have it come through on the warmer side rather than the squeaky side. Because it's a kooky sound, but it's a nice sound. But we've got plenty going on up here with our brass and everything. We don't want to be introducing it as one of those sounds. It's just this very subtle sort of squidgy underneath or inside the mix. And that, that gets that working nicely. In terms of EQ, it's just a case of getting it to sit nicely in the mix without being squeaky. Squidgy, good. Squeaky, not good. Plenty of reverb and what have you on that sits in the mix nicely. They're, they're sort of incidental sounds, so we've got a lot of our mix happening now. Again, if I didn't, if I was to release this just like this, I'd let a lot of those synth sounds be fuller, but we got more to come which is in our rhythm section. So we've essentially got rhythm section here kind of happening twice. The intro bass is different from this. I'll show you what's coming and then we'll go back to it. This has to work with everything else.
Now at this point I might actually turn my mix up. I, I'm sorry if this has seemed, the mid sounds have seemed a little quiet to now. They seem all right to me. But once I pull this in, it feels a little light on. Yeah, I mix low. I refuse to mix. But we're going to need to make decisions which are very much based around. So we need to be able to to hear that as well. Now notice I'm not driving anything here. Oh, which also reminds me when I got this, the dynamic the glue compressor was on too. <laughs> Don't run that when you're running a mastering section. Because in, in, in essence, you had two mastering sections, one after another, both active. Technically there were three, but one of them was turned off. Um, Don't do that. Don't mix into that either. It will lead you into problems. So, I've turned this up because we need a, a stronger sense of... Because this is what's to come. So we're... This may seem a little thin, a little less so once the volume's up. sounds thin. Piano no longer sounds thin. Mistake it's easy to make is to make your piano sound nice and big on its own, put it in with a mix and then the piano sounds wrong. So everything's got to work together and when you know you've got to put a lot of welly in with our basses and drums or what have you, then allow that piano to be a bit thinner. It takes time to learn that, to, to be able to know what's coming. Uh, but it, once you get it in, the difference is, is quite amazing. Because that allows these lower parts to speak. And if your music is written properly, which this is, if your bass matches what's happening in your piano, well, largely by playing the fundamental, then they're actually going to work together and you'll hear some of the bass coming off the bass as though it's in the piano because you've got the overtones, if not all of the fundamental in the piano, but the fundamentals coming from your bass, the two sounds will merge in your brain and you will hear the bass, but you'll also hear the nice fat piano low end as one because you're not trying to put both of them in there together. You're saying, look, I'll prioritize this one over that one. There are times where you would prioritize your piano over your bass, but this is not one of them. Step sideways for the moment. We have a bass in the intro. Now in the very first thing I played with the SoundCloud out of the forum, this was a real problem. This was super loud and it was mashing itself up into this sound. This sound, I did process a bit. Where is it? Obviously didn't do anything to the EQ. I put a tiny bit of reverb on it because it's already got tons of it. But I obviously processed it a bit here. I knew I'd process it, processed it somewhere, so this. A pair of these guys. They're even related to each other. Same developer. Oh my god, I should get paid for this. The sound on its own is bypass. And where's my bypass there? Kind of harsh. It's a hard sound. See, it does that. And I know when he made it, he loved that sound. It's obvious, because he did it. Super cool, it's meaty, it's mean. But why did this track want meaty and mean on the front end? It was frightening. It takes a it fights with the beauty of the top line. Now, there are situations where you might want to do that. Um, plucked steel guitar. 
on uh, on what's going to be a metal track. But you note the two don't really happen together. Here you've put two opposing things together, and in your first mix that I heard, you really forced them together to try to be both at once. And quite honestly, I think through the sense of fashion, because fashion seems to prefer ugly, or it has, and thank God I think that's going away, because I'm starting to hear some pretty work, which is brilliant. Um, I think you pushed it far too hard, and that was what bothered me in the first listen. So we need to have these two sounds work together nicely. What's the more important of the two? That synth sound is gorgeous. Oh, you can hear a little bit of cracking. I've got something in the forum about this, that with some VST, these guys do it slightly, I hear cracking in the sound. It upsets the sound. That's why, because these do a little bit. Not as bad as some. So the first thing was to take that sound, hear how the lead sound seems to have changed. It helps the lead sound cut better, so this sound on its own gets ugly. Just subtly giving it its bass, because it's a bass sound, it's supposed to speak more there. But it's starting to speak a lot up top here as well. But we've got a beautiful sound on top. We don't want to fight with that. So I've given it more in the bass, but rolled off the garbage. We don't need our sub flubbing around. It's all up here, which is this one. So 70, that's low enough. Below that, no joy. Get rid of it. Uh, but we've pulled out this and so the 500s is, is a lot of busy now it's not to say it doesn't sound good it uh, it does but the problem is By getting rid of some of those mids there in the four five hundred arena, we give more clarity for this low end because that's what the sound's roll was. And then as the the ugly sounds come up, as it drives a bit, it lets that sort of be play playing here. But it remember it gets too too bright with our. Uh, Two have to play together. And they play better that way. You still get the sense of it having done its grindy stuff. This I used, again, quite subtly, the attacks, not, not slow, but it's more just as it pushes hard. I didn't want that to get too loud. It gets loud. I don't want it to be too loud at that point. So no makeup, and I'm using it to overall pull the level back. So that's that section. That section sort of stands on its own. It's not really repeated, it's just there. Um, but it's beautiful, so... And then we get into the next bit, which is... where we've got all this happening. Now, I struggled with this to start with for a couple of reasons. One, because as I said before, there were things here that actually didn't have a purpose. I'm trying to work out what their purpose is, and they weren't there. Um, so that kind of made a bit of a mess. Um, after a while, because I as I was mixing some of this stuff up here, I knew I had drum beats to come, and I, I should have mentioned this before. So I actually put this in. 
It's like, oh, okay, what's the simplest way to have? And that seemed the simplest way. And then I realized, hang on, that really is our drum track. So I started to build around this. Now what this does is kind of interesting. It's here. Again, you initially think, oh no, it's just a loop. But no, wrong. There's, uh, there's more to it than that. There are sections where it's cut up. So it's a loop that's come from somewhere and it was a little bit more complexly named but I simplified the name. I kind of got the feeling that the way that it was initially mixed was almost trying to hide the fact that it was a loop and after a lot of backwards and forwards I decided that the way that I was going to go with it was to try and actually emphasize what it was. I did struggle with some of this extra wiring in here he's got this running side chain two things now part of my first thought was to get rid of it because i don't side chain shit to nothing but when i looked at it they didn't sound bad uh side chaining to the base i actually thought it was working upside down it seemed to make the base louder rather than actually pumping um I would have got rid of that, definitely, because I thought, well, if that's not doing what it's meant to do, then why is it here? But at the same time, I actually liked the way it sounded. So rather than saying, look, I need to overdo this with my thing, I like the way it sounds. I'm just going to leave it there, even if I think it's perhaps not doing it quite right, technically, because it sounds good. So in that sense, I, I left it alone. But be cautious of this kind of wiring to duplicate things and side chain them all over the place. Be very, very careful. I know it's easy to think, but, but I know what I'm doing and this is producery shit. It produce how, proves how producery I am. And... Yeah, I'm going to go with you if the mix that comes out of that is like producery as fuck. And we're all like... Not in slices, but the whole sound. If the whole song is like, oh my God, like Into Sandman, when we first enter, heard Into Sandman, Exit Live, it was huge. Bob Rock, if he'd wired everything to everything and stuck a jack up um, Lars's ass, that was the right thing to do. But I think we would have found that it was still a relatively elegant mix inside of all of that. So just please be cautious. I left this here because I didn't feel like it had sonically done damage and I didn't want to pull it apart and try and redo it because it's not my cup of meat. But I left it because, as I say, in the end, I didn't think that it did a bad job. But what I did to the loop, just because you might be thinking, oh, what are those things there? <laughs> they're, they're kind of not my thing and in some ways I would be happy to turn them off. But... I listened to the result before I said my ego is better than his ego. After a lot of backwards and forwards, I've decided to make this drum loop, which is clearly a loop because it's doing this kind of stuff. It's chopped up. I would turn it into a loop, make it behave like one. And what's the best way to make a loop sound like a loop? Not to mess around, not to mess about with in between processing, but to mash it. Now this is actually one of my favourite tools at the moment. It's free. I don't know why it's free. It's a beaut tool. It's uh, there's all kinds of compressors and saturators and this, that, and the other. This one does a nice job. I don't like what it does when you first turn it on, but it does a nice job. So I've gone aggressive with this. I've gone heavy handed, which is to make it feel somewhat like this is a third hand loop. that's come off a record that's gone through tape, that's gone through all kinds of processes that I have been a bit mean to it. Really fast. It's a bit, then I've turned up the output level here, I've squashed it, 
turned up the output level and given it its full measure of drive. So let's back out. Kind of nice and polite. You can do all kinds of things to try to make it sound beefy, but it's a loop. So where you've got your... <laughs> They're obvious! I'm not trying to hide them. I'm not trying to pretend this is a drummer. This is a loop. I want everyone to know that this is a loop. Not for any kind of arrogance, but because we're never going to convince people that it's real. Plus, there's a strong element of, if any of you remember it, Café Del Mar in this, which was that combining these sorts of things together. And loops were a big part of that. And that's what I'm saying is like, okay, let's get right up in the middle of this, that this is what we've got. It brings the reverb and everything right up in this. Now you'll notice no reverb, no send here. This is odd. For me, I would normally do that. There was, however, a problem. If I send, can you hear that? It's like water sound. I tracked that down to being the, um, in the reverb unit, it's not. I don't think it's the reverb unit's fault. It's in the uh, the the reflect the the um the IR the the Instagram photograph that I've used as a reverb. Uh, it does not handle drums. Doesn't matter what kind of drum I give it. It seems it seems okay with a tambourine, but with with drums, it just does this weird ass water sound. messed up <laughs> don't know why so there's you'll notice the, the the drums haven't gone through that process at all what i ended up doing because they have to go through something to bring them together because the problem is if you don't do that I've got a drums bus when i overnighted it through my sub i realized that everything was just too much in the low end so i've rolled off some of that just slightly because it's boosted elsewhere in the master so too many boosts too much it sounds great here but in the lounge room on a less than stellar system uh, it just it, it was too much um, you you could easily say it sounded great it was controlled but it was swamping some of the clarity on the top end lovely bass wrecked the track okay so everything goes through a bus here which was my drums bus uh, walk up to that so what I did with the drums on their bus to solve the fact that I couldn't put them into the, the shared thing was this so all the drums go through this that's nothing here it's kind of dry because I couldn't put them through the shared reverb, I had to have another solution. The solutions were swap the reverb, but I'd invested a lot of time and it sounds wonderful for all of the other stuff. For that horn, it is just superb. Couldn't ask for a nicer reverb. So it's a case of, well, I could kill it and, and swap reverbs, which just didn't seem like the smartest way to go at the time. Or to say, well, look, these are drum loops, and I've just got to pull them together. And that was this, which was to say, let's give them a little bit of, not really a reverb, but just a short echo with a bit of feedback. I turned off diffusion because it was nicer where they were very slappy, but I've really... EQ'd quite aggressively, but that, that small, what we'd call early reflections in a sense, 
just gives the drums overall a sound that they didn't otherwise have. So if we take, let's just take the whole drum section. Yeah, it stops. Bypass the bus. Dry. A bit lifeless. You can hear that instant slapback, but in many ways you don't hear it. So if we go out to a bigger part of the mix, bypass. The drums still sound like they're kind of flat, but they just hang there. There's still a sense of drums and the rest of the mix being a little bit separate, but because of everything else they kind of come together and because we've got them together they still work. It's not my favoured way of doing it but if you end up in a situation like I've got there where your main reverb will not cut it for some bizarre reason like it sounds like a toilet then that's another way you can go about it. So in this case I said okay I'll take all my drums put them together give them this little early reflection which gives them a bit of spark and life and then I can move forward. So my main loop was just push it. So if we took our beauty loop, go back to it, we'd go there. By pushing that loop, yes, there's a massive volume difference, but by pushing that loop the way that I have, by compressing it a lot, it brings up the jazzy vibe, which is in those, the rides and the reverb that's, that's baked into that loop. And giving it that loopy feel by making it a bit crunchy, a bit grungy. The symbol, didn't need to do a lot with that um, or oh, a lot of the level on this was on on a lot of these parts was a bit how's your father but see so it's I think he actually rolled off some of the highs don't be afraid of your highs they, they're more often than not your friend they don't make something thin they give you character uh, so I, I reinstated those. Uh, that's that. The tambourine is an important part of the mix, oddly enough. Where are you, Mr. Tambourine Man? Play a song for me. Where would you go? There, of course, I'm looking for the wrong thing. When I opened this up and there were all those eight send tracks and I'm going through working out well what's important what can I kill what's what turns out to be redundant to not be doing anything at all this was the important one uh, so that's why it was done this way to echo it off and give it that reverb because this is its most important function he hadn't used it as much on other tracks um, I've probably used it more, but that's the important function of that. It's a sample, so it's the same every time. Now we get a little bit of movement from the echo. His echo, 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 echo was, where is it, down here, he'd used the DDL1, um, which is an incredibly flat digital delay. It's not bad, but it's flat, it doesn't move. And again, he'd mixed it sort of like this, which as I said before, was kind of stupid when you're sending to ascend. You want to mix that way and then you mix via how much you send. Uh, so I've added some wobble and movement. So there's some movement here in the sand, but it didn't give me everything I wanted. It's still prone to feeling pasted on. 
which means that you're then prone to kind of like it doesn't sound right so you can turn it up and then it makes it too dominant which makes it even more static in the mix which makes the rest of the mix feel wrong when it's just really an issue of it's a sample and it's the same sample it sounds the same every time so the way I ended up solving it came through an accident it wasn't an accident I was just looking at I knew there was a problem with it frequency wise and I was looking at well what do I do is it EQ not there tambourine and I was playing around with EQ in here he lowered it probably to try to solve that problem and also trying to warm the mix up and I had got one of these and I was sort of moving it around actually no it wasn't that it was this in bell mode and I'm moving it around like that as it played and it's like that solves my problem it was a lack of movement it wasn't a static frequency it needs to be EQ'd right it needs to move so all that went by the by and I'm going to find my tambourine line, which is... Oh, I can't find it here because it's, uh, it's a bit of a... It's a bit of, I don't like breakouts because I find them to be a pain in the patootie. Tambourine. You might, look, might have noticed this and gone, oh, that's a bit strange. What are we doing with this? It's a lot for a tambourine. So I found a way to automate what happened as I was looking around for the solution. And what I heard was it moving through the frequency. Now it'd be easy to say, oh well I've got any, I'm going to get complex and I'm going to have it do that sweep the same every single time. But you know what's going to happen? It now sounds exactly the same. You might as well just have that sample. It needs to be moving. It was the moving that provided the solution to the problem. And at that particular point, I was doing this kind of movement. So while I tried using other shapes, it was the down movement where the, where the money was. Tried a few other things. I didn't really want to use this EQ, but um, it's, it's, a lot of EQs just don't necessarily make it easy to automate them. And I know there there would be plenty of EQs and plenty of EQs that I've got, but I wanted to move on. I didn't want to bog down for 12 hours solving a simple problem. The problem was already solved. It was just how to execute it. So this one would do it. A uh, fairly high boost. Had to mess around with the cue to get it right. We don't want this having a sweep sound. We don't want anybody to know that this is happening and set it to a point where it did not happen on the beat. It doesn't want to happen on the beat, it just wanted to be that every time it triggered it would be somewhere in this sweep, not in the same place. And that was it. That was the... Oh, actually, no, this is the one where I took it from a send and put it onto an insert. No, you're right. The other one's uh, the one quarter that belonged to... Yep, I'll do whatever that was. That belonged to one of the other things. This was the one, the... the... So I put that into an insert where it belongs and put the mix into a more appropriate kind of a way. And yes, I did stay, sorry, I did stay with this one with the static. That might be a problem. And it may be part of why this sounded so static. Um, I don't know why my brain's not functioning. Not slept well last, last couple of nights, I guess. But nonetheless, what I said about this echo, it belonged to another, another instrument initially. But what I said about swapping it for one of these to one of those to the echo is true. It's about movement. This one I decided to keep because it is quite a staticky sort of thing. But in the end, it became a problem. But this helps create that movement and you put movement into the core sound which means that each one of these echoes is slightly different relative to what it was before so quite a bit of work on a tambourine <laughs> but 
but it makes it sit more comfortably, more naturally, rather than mucking around with a whole lot of other things. We could have done something similar with a flanger, but the problem with the flanger is it's it's cyclical and we would hear it as cyclical, whereas this we don't hear as cyclical. We don't even know it's happened. And that that's good in this case. Sometimes you want to know that it's happening. You want a really early 80s mix, then you'll put like a an echo on with really short timing and high feedback so that there is some of that flangey whine coming through but in this case it did not want that and then we've got this extra kick it's kind of a kind of a strange one boys and girls it's from this drum machine and it's broken out I like I say I probably wouldn't have done it that way I would have seen it as more elegant to have um, different devices but you started somewhere and you kind of kept moving um, so you ended up with some mess which we had to deal with later if you turn your volume up you'll quickly realize that um, actually I'll turn it up for you this is not in time and as we've noticed with some of the other loops they're not in time either problem until you hear them together. They move around each other and they actually work. So for a moment there when I heard some of his loose timings I was a bit like oh am I supposed to fix this but as soon as I put it back together it's like I didn't hear it before. It's it's actually a good thing. So good on you for not going through and quantizing that to, uh, to Kingdom Come. This is largely what he had on the processing in this drum. I'm not sure what his thinking was in having these two drums together. I think he was trying to boost the... Where am I going wrong way? I think he was trying to boost the initial loop, or maybe he was trying to... I don't know where the original thinking was, but the two of them ended up there together. They don't play exactly the same thing. So I looked to make this one just add a little slightly different character from the other drums. So we've got these pair of drums, pair of kick drums, sorry, because we don't have much else in the way of drums in here. That's a lower, and that's a brighter. Could be brighter again, but then it starts to sound like a drum machine sample. I didn't bother moving this around in any way because we're not as sensitive to bass as we are to treble. Uh, and it's kind of embedded in the uh, the main loop and I made sure it stayed that way that you're not going like oh there's two drums there you just hear the one loop like it's the same thing and that's the drums they were they were tricky but I think they were overly complexified by attempts to overly complexify and produceriness and what have you from the beginning uh, and Again, my advice is if you get somewhere and you go, look, now I'm going to change direction, get rid of everything else. Even say, look, I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to start again. Create a new instrument, copy the MIDI across, start again. Do not allow clutter to get in the way because then your thinking around this thing is cluttered as well. When you're looking at it, you might be going, oh, but this is where I'm at now. But the Everything that went before, because you haven't gotten rid of it, is still there affecting your thinking when you look at it. You, you lose clarity, is the other way of putting it. Bass, this bass, my low funk bass. <laughs> okay, <laughs> someone called it that. Um, where is it here? Intro bass, that next one here. Let's get out of that. So we've got the other one, and then this one comes in. Mm -hmm. 
Monotone may be a simple but a simple synth, but when you get it where it wants to be, it delivers. So it's it's a good thing now. He'd got the saturation knob on there already. No argument from me on that at all. He wanted to grunty it up. Not a problem. Not a problem. That that worked. Uh, that worked nicely. Why he'd put them in a combinator, I don't know. Maybe that was just, maybe that was the patch, although it doesn't indicate that. So my advice is don't put something in a combinator unless you really need to put it in a combinator. It's not gonna change the sound. If we had our instrument, which would have our track above it, and then we just whacked a saturator underneath it, it's gonna sound exactly the same. And we're not gonna have to look at this combinator. So I minimize my use of combinators, not through being anti-combinator. I like combinator. It's a very cool thing that it's there. But you know what? Most of the time you don't need to use it, in which case don't use it. Um, if you started to go somewhere and then didn't end up doing all that stuff, not necessarily, if it were me, I wouldn't necessarily remove it from its combinator. But if it started to feel annoying, I actually would. I'd just uncombine the thing. Because um, here... It seems like a process, a thing that you did that didn't serve a purpose. So try not to do those things in the first place. You might go, oh, but I'm being organized. I'm putting them together. No, you're just adding layers of unnecessariness. Makes you feel good, but layers of unnecessariness. Nice sound. I did, however, hit it with the EQ stick quite a bit. You probably noticed in the AB, if you can remember that far back, that the difference between his bass and my bass was quite profound. That his was bright and forward and in your face, which is this. Big and plasticky, almost a bit CZ. The problem with that in the mix, hear how it doesn't sit nicely. It's fighting with everything else in the mix. It's saying, look here, look at me. Whilst at the same time, we got the trumpet going, look, look at me. It's, it's a, bit of a bit of a head fuck, really. So what's the bass's role? The bass's role is to underpin what's going on. And it's part of the groove here. It's a nice part of the groove. It really is. I didn't look at the bass to see whether it was played live or what. But it's a nice part of the groove. We didn't need that one. Roll off a little bit here. We don't want muddiness. His EQ was here. Seems the obvious thing, and I go, I say this every single time. What do you want to boost? Ooh, the bass. But look where this bass is. This bass is down at like 40 hertz. That's great. If you've got a sub, that's great. No one's got a sub. It sucks. You can make this rounder by emphasizing your first harmonic. We can see it here, this one here. Try it yourself at home, kiddies. Put your boost where you think you want it down here on the lowest note. Wonder why you're just not getting that beautiful, smooth, round bass with majesty that you think that you deserve. Because you don't deserve it. Move your boost to the first harmonic. Your bass will suddenly sound fuller, rounder, and far more likely to be heard on a system without a sub. Because we're now boosting at 120, which is where we've got bass and punch. Punch. A track is more interested in punch than it is in bassiness. Bassiness is an illusion that really only appeared after people started ha using lots of headphones and had things greater access to subs and things like that. Before that, a mix was always about punch. Listen to Joan Jett's I Love Rock and Roll. That is punch, punch, punch. And it stormed up the charts and you know that song. And if you don't think you know the song, go to YouTube, dial it up. Oh, I love rock and roll. Because it was mixed with punch. If they'd mixed it for bass, it's not to say it wouldn't have worked. 
but it wouldn't have rocketed it up the charts. They mixed it for punch. You want punch? You want that bass to feel like it's punching? Find your first harmonic, push that through. Get that up into 120. There are times where I've even gone to the second harmonic and pushed, but it's not as effective. Find your first harmonic, it lifts you out of the sub arena and puts you into the bass arena. I also rolled off this. It's it's just filling up that area. It's it's it is plasticky, cardboardy. It's a cool sound, but it's causing problems with a busy mix. So I've got it out of the way. That also, by getting rid of this, this is masking some of the bass. We've told our brain, ooh, there's going to be bass, but we picked it here rather than there, which means the brain actually turns that up to put it back. See, if we look at this and it's supposed to be really loud, then the first harmonic would be not quite as loud. If we make the first harmonic a bit louder, the brain will go back and turn up this. Free processing. If this is very busy just above your bass, it's actually masking your bass. In other words, it becomes louder and it, it makes your bass seem less. So we get rid of some of that because it's just filling up our mix. Not a lot, 3 dB down. Now, if you're focusing only on your bass sound, you're gonna go, well, right now it's better, Benedict. Why would we cut that stuff out? It sounds cool, it's nice and... Because I'm not interested in the bass sound. I'm interested in the song. It is not my role to make your bass sound awesome. It's my role to make your song sound awesome. When you're writing, your role is to write an awesome song. It's not your role to find an awesome bass. How stupid's that? Your job is to write an awesome song. When someone's mixing your song, whether that's you or me or Bob Rock, the job is to make an awesome sounding song. Not an awesome sounding bass mix, but an awesome sounding song. And while that sounds good, that sounds better because it's pushing the bass down to where it belongs and it lets it be bassier, which is what you wanted. Plus, you've got a lot of jazzy type elements on top. You're pushing there being some sort of jazz feel. What does a jazz bass sound like? A big ass bull fiddle? It's not up here, it's down there, but it's always a beautiful clear sound. So we're breaking some conventions. Now I'm all for being iconoclastic, but that was too much plasticky in there. Same with the top end here. Nice and gritty and sort of greebly squidgy, but pushing its way through the mix like it doesn't belong. I know initially you think, oh, I like that because I can hear the eek, eek, eek on the, on the top of that bass sound as it comes through and, oh, it really punches through the mix. Yeah. You having fun? No. So we haven't lost it. We've just de-emphasized it to allow its role as a bass to play and therefore... All of that really comes through nice and clearly. We've said this is what's important, not the bass. The bass is doing its job beautifully. It's down the bottom there going. Brilliant. So that that's why the mix sounds more splashy because we've said this is what's important. You can focus on this. The other stuff will move aside. The last bits were really just sound effects. They, um, I don't recall what if what I did with those. I don't think a lot. No, none of them got any any processing at all. Just some EQ. 
Um, I'll quickly work through them. I don't remember them to be to be honest a lot. Um, nothing wrong with that. That's actually a that's a good sign. I'll get rid of that. Gives us a bit of space to see what we're looking at here. So the first one was this. This is, again, in theory, wrong. You shouldn't send several things off in one track. Um, again, with creating one sand out of slices of other sands. Interesting. I just wouldn't think to do it. At least not that much. There are times where I've sort of said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll just move that. But I'm, I'm, I was never an audio guy. So when I see people do it and do it effectively, I'm always a bit like... <laughs> We've got a couple of different sounds on the one track. In theory, you shouldn't, but they were all balanced enough that in the end, it doesn't really matter. It didn't cause me a problem. It does mean that they've got the same EQ across them. That doesn't matter. He had been pretty aggressive in his original EQ and, and largely right. I listened to it and... They sound great. A sneaky feeling that come from a movie but they're very full frequency whereas in reality what they're supposed to do is sit inside our wider mix the sort of thing that first listen or two you don't really think of as being there but they're just part of the environment so that was cool this next one Okay, cool. This one has quite a bit in the low end, but you'll see I didn't chop most of it off. You can hear stuff in the low end, but where it comes is here. So there's no conflict. Where it comes again is essentially in the same situations. So I did not need to do much more than get rid of anything that even a sub's not going to behave with. Panning noise. This was a this was a kooky one. It appears in this break, which I'll have to discuss soon. Got to be carried away with that one. Really done the right thing by just getting rid of the, the tops and bottoms because it's a supporting sand, not the main sand. It's, there wasn't really anything else that needed to be done with that. Chimes wood. Oh yeah, like little wooden. I just boosted across the board. Didn't really feel the need to do anything else because sits in nicely like that, sits in the background, just adds a little bit of character at the couple of points it appears. These blips were a bit of a tricky one. You've got other sounds like them around them, but they're a bit... I almost went dynamic EQ on this one, but I felt like I got there without the need to. Partly because... They're different from one to another. Again, there's some kind of collage of bits and pieces, but they work. So that's all my sounds put into the mix. He got his panning on his his trumpet thing already. We'll look at the we'll look at the panning just before we go to the the anti-panning moment. So, this me. A lot of things are fairly well centered. They're all effects, so they don't need to move. I didn't bother putting any movement in the vocals. I didn't want this to feel ping pongy. The uh, the trumpet already does ping-pong itself around. I did 
didn't have a problem with that. I didn't even think of it, to be honest. The piano, we explained what we did with that. There is some panning in the intro here. I moved this bass slightly off to one side and the lead slightly off to another. That allows them to feel less jammed in together. So where you've got two big sounds at once, rather than saying, oh, I'll make them sound bigger by making them even more stereo on their own and that'll solve all my problems. Sounds great when, you're, when it's alone, when there's no other sound, but you're better off narrowing them down. So you see I've narrowed them down a little bit move them off just a bit to the side. Again, we are not looking for panning out here. There is nothing worse than you start listening to a mix and you can hear these two acoustic guitars that are trying to peel your head backwards. Not through loudness, but just through being spaced so far out. That it's, like, it's not comfortable to listen to. Now, I know I get that perhaps a little more than some people because I've got my speakers right out here. Most people would put them here, sort of thing, but mine are out there. So they're like this big ass set of headphones. But if I can hear it here, I know it's wrong when I go back out into the real world. I'll, it'll, it'll feel weak out in the real world. So it's, it's just a general thing. It wasn't a thing that had happened here, but there's a tendency for us to make everything super stereo. Going, it sounds better that way. Yeah, it does, until it sounds a lot worse, which is far sooner than you realize. So narrow down these sounds a little bit and then control the stereo myself by just moving them slightly apart, which means that this speaker can speak one sound with a little less interference and this speaker can speak this sound with a little less interference, more clarity, more oomph overall by having less winning. That's basically everything that happened in panning until we get to, remember this little section here where we will get rid of the mixer and go back up to here. This again is a case of, I said I can show a more elegant way. Uh, through most of this as things run, it doesn't do anything. If you listen carefully. The mix narrows down. The stereo is taken away. Now this was here already. The stereo going away was there already and when, it, when it came to me. It took me a while to work out what was going on because it was wired like a nutcase. I'm sorry, but it was wired inelegantly when you could do it better. One way to do it better would be to say, okay, and create a bus. So you go to your mixer and you say, I'll take this track to my last track, put them all in a bus. That's one way of doing it, which is more elegant than what you had. The other way is if it's happening on the master, just put it in the masters. Don't go creating some kind of weird, I'll pipe it to here to a combinator and pipe it back to itself kind of thing. Messed up thinking. It just creates, well, mess. I'm looking at this thing going, what on earth is this? It took me a while to work out what it was and what it did. I then basically dragged it in here. I had to copy and paste a bit of stuff to get it there, but I dragged it inside because you know what? It's on the whole master. I've put it before what you might call my master chain, my master chain starting with the usual glue compressor. Now remember all that stuff's off at the moment, but I put that here. So we had, let's just mute this. I reprogrammed your combinator knob to here. Wee, 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 wee. Cool. Nicely done. Nice idea. If I thought it was a bad idea, I'd have dumped it. I don't think it was a bad idea at all. I thought it was a cool idea. But the problem with narrowing your stereo field alone is that you know it's there, and that's it. Nobody else is going to hear it. It's not as effective as you hoped it was going to be. I don't know whether you noticed that, or whether you thought it was still effective because you knew it was there and you were hearing what you wanted to hear. So I thought, look, you've kind of not really achieved what you wanted. So I said, let's, let's attack this another way. So I put in one of these guys, set high and low passes, 
set their default values so they were outside of anywhere remotely important for what we're doing and <laughs> watch the numbers fly so everything really squeezes in at that end point your, your curve is perhaps more subtle than I might have done I probably would have been a little bit more dramatic really make people know but at, right there at that end you start to get the the kind of lemon face feeling because not only is it narrowed this way but it's narrowed this way as well our frequency gets pretty darn tight we're down at by the time we're, we're finished we've got two to three K left everything else is that's why it's and I chose that you know it's the it's a slightly uncomfortable frequency so that we get that sort of like ooh, because the payoff is here it throws that stereo back out again however there was a thing that you kind of did wrong your idea was great your execution was flawed just as I've noticed a lot of your other timings were loose but in terms of the piece works nicely here you had not paid enough attention and this is where things work or don't work what had happened was that your peak here your last dot was actually past the first beat in the next bar why is that not snap I don't know that's probably part of why because you didn't have any things in snap I don't know but nonetheless this was over the one where does the first beat come here on the one maybe before the one even but it's on the one because everything here is on the one because you still had your stereo narrowed here which is after the first beat the beginning of that return beat was actually pinched and then it opened up laughter so rather than coming in it came in which is a completely different effect and I don't think the one you were looking for so you'll see that here I come to my pinch everything and then I actually open the stereo slightly before the one because if I open it on the one or after the one I'm going to lose the beginning of that being out here it's going to be like that which is different so that tiny amount of time there is not really noticed and even if it is noticed it's a little like a backward snare in front of a forward snare that little sucking sound before the actual snare emphasizes what comes after so just a little thing that made a huge difference it kind of undid what you were trying to do by being late so the tiny detail there means that you've now got like getting that right means that this now has a noticeable impact and I've discovered it because I, I didn't think it would have been done that way I discovered it because I'm thinking this just isn't as effective as it should be why, why is this not working as well as it should there yes the narrow down bit worked but the come back in wasn't working looked at it found that it was over the one you know oh it had gone over the next beat which we want to reintroduce that way so cool idea slightly sketchy in the execution and that's really all that's gone awry in this mix was that it's an interesting track all your core sounds are good and really well suited to what they're doing but the execution just meant that you you were often interested in adding complexity producery tips and tricks kind of stuff like wiring off to here and there um, or combining things that don't need combining rather than saying where's my story because your story was there all along all it needed to be was recognized 
Don't spend your time mixing, thinking, oh, but when I mix, I EQ to this frequency and I do this and I wire that. Well, that's not mixing. That's called masturbating. Fine. Have dreams about that at night, about how you're going to wake up in the morning and set frequencies and wire things to things. That's great. Have fun with it. But not when you're working. When you're working to make music, you're telling a story. Find your story. Tell it. You had your story here. It was your trumpet combined with your, with your voices, combined with your pianos. There's your story. Once you've got that right, everything else flows because everything else is like, how does this support my story? Not how do I make a big a, a bass sound perfectly bass like by the 10 tips and tricks or the 10 versions, the 10 best versions of 10 best tics, tips and tricks that I've read on the 10 best YouTube lists. It gets so horribly recursive and fractal and messed up. Find your story. Once you've found your story, which has nothing to do with producer -y shit. It's to do with that. Once you've found that, the mix tells you what to do with itself. Yes, over time, you will find ways to, to know, oh, look, that's probably going to be a better method, like my handling the, um, the, the tambourine. That's a better method. Um, they come with time, but you're, you're constantly making them up. Something that I see is that people go, oh, well, you know, on, on Dark Side of the Moon, they, they, they went into the corridor. So they go, oh, well, I should, how to make a great vocalist to go into a corridor. They make the solution into a problem rather than finding the problem and finding the solution. So really nice track. I've really enjoyed working on this. Once I got through the frustration of separating what should be there from what should not be there, then it became really enjoyable to, to piece together this collage into a unit and then to make everything else work around it. So where it seems like I'm picking on you, I'm not picking on you at all, picking on the process by which people get led astray and undo what their work is. Now, if you want to watch me go through and master it again, we will do that. I'll just turn that to, to down. We'll just get rid of those so we've got a little bit more space. Matter of fact, we don't need that at all. Nor do we need to even see those because our job here is to take our already nice mix. Which I'll need to see a little bit of it. First thing, she will go to the ladder a bit. As I've said, I work quiet. Always good to work quiet. You can never go wrong working quiet. As long as you can hear what's going on, you're going well. If you're working loud, you're hearing less. I know, but you're hearing less. Initially, I set my levels here without the extra gain, but then it's like, no, nah, look, I can drive this harder. So I added, ooh, 6 dB, that's a lot for me. But then I wanted to push this mix hard to get that sound. It's not a sound I normally use, but I wanted to get that sound for this mix, because I need to honor this song. Not what I normally do, but this song. So quite a bit of push into the front end here. Went for a slightly faster attack time than I would here. All I'm looking for here is glue. This is nothing to do with levels. Absolutely nothing to do with controlling any levels whatsoever. I'm just looking to glue this track to make it dance. Which means that we're looking to either let lots of transients come through and then kind of close down afterwards, or a little less transients come through and close down afterwards. So we're looking to make the track do this, but not in any noticeable way. If this starts to sound like it's side chain pumped, you have gone completely ass about wrong direction. We're looking for it to come together to gel to glue, like the difference between five random guys in a shed and Rod Stewart's backing band, or the E Street band, or the Ace in the Hole band. You know, they glue together. Two to, two to three dB of flicker here is plenty. Four is plenty of plenty, possibly too much. 
So you find your threshold where this does that. A little hard to AB where you've got the input gain, so that's why normally I'm not driving my gain when I do this. So that there's no makeup, there's no anything, all I'm looking for is that point of groove. And I'd found that point of groove basically already, and then it's like, no, I want to pump this, this whole mix a little bit harder. So, job done with that one. Now, normally I then do my EQ next. So we'll do that. I decided I wanted to use this fella instead of the normal M class. I just wanted more saturation in this mix, to be honest. Hear how that just adds a nice authority? It doesn't make it bassier. It adds authority in the bass. That's what we're looking for. Just a tiny boost that's adding authority. A lot of times I don't, but in this case I wanted to do that. Now, more importantly, this here. I've come fairly low. Because I want that treble to feel very sizzly and bright and splashy. From one of my own mixes I might have gone up here. But this being essentially more of an EDM type thing, I wanted it to feel very splashy. This is pretty subtle, but I started by actually being quite aggressive. What can I pull out here? And I'm looking for the frequency at which it feels like the, the bass and treble work nicely without that bit. In other words, that bit's not that important. If we boost it, we'll equally feel like it's a bit not very nice, a bit honky. Just a tiny bit. You don't want to go getting aggressive on that. Maybe I could go harder, but I'm happy with my mix. So that's it. This device is defaulted to automatically balancing its gain compensation. While in many ways that's right, a lot of the time I don't like it that way. It's probably just because I learned to EQ without gain compensation. In terms of ABing, the gain compensation is probably good, but I don't really AB my EQs necessarily as much as that might indicate. It's a personal thing. But I got my EQ in, and normally that's done after the compression, because the compression will roll off, it'll lose you some of your beautiful clear highs, your air will get squished. You might say, oh, but use multiband compression. Piss off, I hate multiband compression. Use it as much as you like, don't force it on me. I'm going old school, I want this to sound like real old school music. It's part of my thing. Then I will commonly add a little bit of saturation. Now, Slick is adding its own saturation. I'm just looking for that sense of sparkle and clarity. I know some people have accused me of my mixes being too clear, like that's an evil thing. When you buy a Pink Floyd record, do you want it to sound muddy? Even when you buy a Prodigy record, do you want it to sound muddy? You want it to sound clear. Therefore, clarity. I then thought, well, what if I turn these around the other way? I liked the sound better, it seemed more natural. It was, it was brighter, it was clearer, it was more natural. Cool. So if we go with... 
of course it's going to sound better because it's louder. That's nice, I like that. There's a lot of clarity in there. That's, as I say, part of the style, part of the thing. I will check in mono. Yep. Obviously not as nice, but you can really hear the piano as a old-fashioned recording of a piano. That was my aim there. And that really comes out in mono, which is good. Back. Okay, I just want my level back. At this point, I'm going to go to my maximizer. Now, I do not use this maximizer. It runs through everything until I've got to the point where I'm going to master. And then it gets turned off or removed. <laughs> And I look at my levels. Okay, that's plus six. And I go, okay, I want to get those levels up to where I want them to be. Now, this is done in conjunction with my master, my limiter. Normally I use uh, the onyx, but sometimes, especially with a lot of brightness and treble, sometimes it just splats. What the solution is, I don't know, um, but it just splats, and I end up having to do a lot of stuff to mess up the track rather than being able to move forward. So in that case, I bring in this fella, which does roll off some highs, but it, it's a lot more resilient in that situation. It lets me finish my mix from what I hear rather than forcing me to change my mix. But I don't love this as a limiter. It's not It's not because it's bad. You can throw a lot at it, but it doesn't give me the character I'm looking for. I'm looking for a little bit of character when I'm at this point. <laughs> Into the dragon. Of course, this is set to minus 0.3 of a dB so that we can't somebody's DA converter. And this, I've, again, I've thrown this off into limiting. Just using this for peaks. I'm allowing my mix to go fairly loud. actually acting I've seen it act before but it's um it's not doing a lot this is mostly trying to catch peaks but it's also for this to push into our drive unit and we want this to sound oh that's why it wasn't in haha <laughs> silly me that's better About zero on this is 15. It comes in like with, with all kinds of pump and boost. It's like so many VST, they're designed to make you think that they're better than they are by just turning the volume up. Sneaky, bad practice. But this is just catching tops. So right now we're listening to the, the KHS limiter. Now we're listening more to the leveling too. Hear how it's got its real character to it. It's doing virtually nothing. I don't know that it ever hits more than about a dB or something, even though we're pushing fairly hard. It's then a combination of this, adding a bit of gain here to its saturation settings. Initially, I ran it off at this. It gives it that really pushed forward sound. But when I listened last night, while it sounded great, 
it, it also had some problems across the whole mix, particularly in the intro, it was starting to make things too furry. So I've backed it off a bit. We, we've, well, a long way actually. Uh, and I think it's still going to be right. I think it's still going to sound nice. Uh, but by using this tool instead of one of my cleaner tools or one of my more regular tools, is that this wants to have a lot of saturation on it. So we've got a little bit of saturation on a lot of our elements, like on our, our loop, there's a lot going on there. That's a bit uglified. I don't think that adds any saturation, but there's a little bit there, there's a little bit there. It's better to add lots of little bits than it is to add one lot of lump because it's gonna be hard to control and it's gonna get out of control very easily. So that basically is it. Because I don't trust this to be a nothing passes this line, I've just brought in this to make sure nothing passes this line. And you know what? Nothing does pass that line. My crest factors are still good. My RMS is sitting at about minus 12. My peaks are up here at zero. How that's going to sit on somebody's luff meter couldn't give a flying banana peel. I went into a mix thing recently where I was told it has to be this luffs and that luffs and it's like bugger off. And you might be that's what Spotify does. I know that when I put my mixes on YouTube, they're maybe moved of dB or something. If your mixes are right, you, you, somebody else's love onics will not damage what you do. If you spend all your time focusing on luffs and how it's going to sound on spotty shit, sorry, I mean Spotify, um, then your focus is in the wrong place. Make your mix sound beautiful. There are some mixes that are supposed to be absolutely balls to the wall. There are times where I've done mixes where they are sitting up here on the RMS because that's what the mix needs. If that's going to get the whole mix turned down, so be it. But I'm not mixing up here because I want to mix up here. I'm mixing up there because that's the way to make that mix sound like it's being hit with a freight train. Often there are ways to do it without doing that at all, but if that's what you've got to do, that's what you've got to do. Let the children mess about with their luffs. They can sit there and go, go on and on in forums about their luffs as much as they like. This will give you freedom to focus on what you're doing. Now, a long one, very long one, a lot of sidetrack in a sense, but that's not sidetrack to say, please, let's not listen to this. That's just to, to help get the originator of this track back on track because I can see what went wrong too much mess everywhere which stopped him from focusing on what his focus was which was you know the lovely horn line and the voices and, and the piano and what have you but to help teach you the other person who's watching this that you really don't need to do that stuff the moment you start doing producery shit that you're no longer working on your song you're working on trying to appease somebody else and you know what the best way to appease people who need to be appeased is to ignore their pathetic little selves because normally they've done nothing nothing of any merit whatsoever if alan parsons or bob rock came into my studio and said hey benedict why don't you do this i'd listen to them but if some dick who's released one really scruffy sounding piece of, of work but calls me calls himself some kind of youtube influencer and tells me, you're doing this all wrong because i was like yeah piss off because he's never going to buy your stuff. He's never going to support your stuff. All he supports is making himself feel good. Or herself, but mostly it's himself. Your job when doing this is to sell the listener on buying this track. Taking this track into their life. Not just letting it pass through and disappear out the other end. That's useless. It's like white bread. Your job is to make them go, wow, I need this in my life. I need to play it again. I need to tell my friends I'm playing this again and preferably to purchase it. 
I don't care what your stance on music is um, with regards to money, you want them to purchase it because it means they've really committed to taking this into their life. Somebody who buys a Tony Robbins book is far more committed to actually doing the Tony Robbins thing than somebody who borrows it and gives it back. You want them to take it into their life. So to do that, you've got to tell your story and make your story unique. And look at the records that changed things and that were really powerful. Most of them by the rules of the guy who's going to tell you you have to appease him. Most of them are shit. Early Sisters of Mercy. Sisters of Mercy went on to become a really important band. Not topping the charts, but a really important band. If you listen to the early records, you can get them collected in the Some, Sist Some Girls Wander uh, compilation. Not much chop if we're f obsessing over mixes. But in terms of where that band was going and what they were doing, powerful stuff. Once we hit um, uh, Fear of a Black Planet, the first record, they'd improved their mixes a bit, but they still weren't as lovely as Floodland. But powerful, powerful stuff. Nine on nine. Yeah. It's really, it's a great record. Um, but it's a great record because they focused on their story, not on how great their mixes are. Venom, the other band that I commonly name drop here, they're a band that couldn't play in time. Yet Venom records are like, Rah! The Ramones, although the Ramones were deliberately given the impression that they were worse than they really were. But again, a Ramones record is deliberately quite raw. Uh, so focus on that. These are the things that change the world, that get bored. Uh, so stick to your story and then find the quickest most direct route to get from your story bleep, 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 to on tape and telling the story. Yes, somebody with more experience may be able to do it in a shinier way, but if you've told your story, you've done your job right, and that puts you in a stronger position if you know you're not great at mixing or just plain hated to actually bring in somebody else who's going to respect your story and make it more shiny at the same time. That's how it works. Any questions? Ask them. Obviously, all the usual stuff about subscribe, hit the bell button, blah, blah, blah. You'd have done it if you wanted to. Um, questions? Ask. Oh, if you're one of those people who has to put a thumbs down on something, don't do it if you don't have the balls to actually write why. And do that nicely. If it's just because it's too long, go away. I don't need your thumbs down. You don't need to waste your time putting a thumbs down. Go write to Andrew Wang or someone. That's what you're after. Um, if you would like to have this process done on one of your tracks, please contact me. You could start down there, or probably easier to find me on Facebook or somewhere, or on my site, go to my site, go to the contact form probably in this case, type it in, remember to give me your email address, because if you don't give me your email address, I can't follow you, I can't respond to you, so very open. I'm particularly interested in getting things different from what I've done before. There are some similarities to something I've done before in this, but it's a nice track and I'm really pleased I did it. So thanks very much for your time and for very much thanks for letting me mix this track and present it for you. You have a great day now.